And now, please welcome Pastor Brett Allen as he brings us today's message. We're in a series right now. We've been talking about the final things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. We're talking about life lessons and dying words. And in this series, we have taken a look at each one of the statements that Christ made while he was dying on the cross. We started this series and we started building a cross. The first week, we talked about words of forgiveness. And we talked about Jesus saying as he hung on the cross, looking down on the people who put him there, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Last week, we talked about words of comfort as Jesus had time to talk to a thief to his side and also to address some comments to his mother. Jesus, the only son of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He spent three years teaching, and his words were powerful. They cut through the religious nonsense of the day right to the heart of the matter. But the power of his words were not limited to the synagogues or the hillsides or even the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. They also extended all the way to the last minutes of his life. He would continue to speak words of hope and words of life. Words that are worthy of us stopping and examining and exploring because there are great lessons in them. Man had done his worst, the crucifixion, was an all-out effort to silence Jesus and to remove his influence. In the midst of incredible pain and suffering, Jesus will speak on seven different occasions. We've looked at words of forgiveness and words of comfort, and today we're going to look at words of suffering. We're going to take a look at some of the words that Jesus uttered that reflect the suffering that he was going through. In Matthew 27, 46, it says this, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in John 19, 28, we see our second statement of suffering, later knowing that all was now completed, and so the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. The cross, the spectacle of the cross, the events of the day, the torture, the nails, is a reminder again of how expensive sin is. There is an awful price tag that is attached to sin. In the video about Easter, it just simply said that it created a separation between man and God, and man had to leave paradise. That's expensive. Sin ruins marriages. That's expensive. Sin ruins trust. That's expensive. Sin is expensive, and an awful price had to be paid so that my sin, so that your sin could be dealt with. The wages of sin is death according to Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. As a pastor, I am so grateful that God made a way for my sin to be dealt with. As a pastor, I am so appreciative that God is well-rounded, that God isn't only marked by wrath and by justice, but that God is also marked by mercy. His mercy is seen in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mercy. Mercy that's described in 1 Peter when 1 Peter says this, God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but that everyone would come to eternal life. Mercy. That's what sent Christ to this planet. Mercy is what sent Christ to a cross. Mercy is what kept Jesus on a cross. Mercy is what promised to send the Holy Spirit so that you could have comfort in every situation, in every day, regardless of what you're going through, the comforter would be with you. Mercy is what promises that Jesus will return and take us. And mercy is what has caused God to be building mansions and homes with your name and my name on them. 
That's the mercy of God in operation. God is a merciful God. But that's only half the picture. God is also fair and just. The wages of sin is death. This is a side of God that demands that sin be paid for. This is a side that tells you that yes, in fact, you are responsible for your actions. Yes, you are responsible for what you say. You are responsible for your choices. It holds us accountable to decide what we're going to do with the man in the middle of the scene of Calvary, like we talked about last week, that Calvary is a monument to the idea of choice. God, containing both mercy and justice. As Christ died... Mercy and justice, their roads will intersect. As the blood of Jesus flows, the justice of God is satisfied and sin is paid for. And at the same time, God's mercy is shown as he gives his only son to perform an amazing act of love so that God and man can be in communion again. This is our God, justice and merciful. Jesus died on a cross, but it's important for me to remind you that Jesus was not martyred. Martyrs lose their lives. Martyrs have their lives taken from them. Jesus was not a martyr because in John 10, 18, it says this in the New Living Translation, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Jesus did not die on the cross as a hero against some social injustice. Jesus died as a substitute sacrifice by his choice and designed by God for the sin of the world. Wow. Listen to these scriptures. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that has brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus is on the cross, paying the wages of sin that was due me, that was due you. God is a holy God. God's holiness allows no relationship with sin. When sin is present, a horrible thing takes place. Separation with God occurs. The expensive thing about sin is that it creates distance and separation between you and God. It always works that way because God is a holy God and sin separates. One of the horrible things about hell is not going to be the flames. One of the horrible things about hell will be the eternal separation from God. God's goodness, God's protection, God's love, God's presence, God's voice, everything that God is and that God created and that God brings to us, we will be separated from God. What a horrible price to pay and what an awful price had to be paid for sin because it creates separation. The issue here, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is an issue of separation. When Jesus became sin for us, a separation occurred. To remember a couple of important things, I want to drop back a little bit in the story about Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And I want to explain one more thing, one more time, about the Garden of Gethsemane as it relates to this statement. It says in Mark 14, he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Luke twenty two forty four describes this evening this way. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The garden scene is a time of difficulty, great pain emotionally for Jesus. My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. This is his response to the death he was facing. It wasn't brought on by the betrayal. It wasn't brought on by the fact that his friends wouldn't pray for him, instead they slept. It wasn't because of his anticipation of mockery or torture or the nails. It's that he would bear all of the sin of the world. Every sin ever committed would be put to Christ and he would become a vehicle that would transport your sin and my sin to a cross. And he knew that when he became sin for us, it would create a separation between him and a holy God. Jesus will ask God a question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That question has bearing and it has impact and it has backing in this 22nd Psalm. Psalm 22, 1 says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Jesus is quoting a prophecy about his crucifixion. We know that when this was written, this was not descriptive of David's death. This is not how David died. David died as an old man in his bed. David wrote this psalm in the 10th century B.C., and crucifixion would not be invented until the 6th century B.C. This account is incredibly accurate because it's prophecy being fulfilled. This also is a reminder to the religious leaders. This scripture was very meaningful to the religious leaders. It's part of the Old Testament. They knew exactly what was being quoted from the Old Testament as Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The religious leaders had an opportunity one last time to see the truth. One last time, Jesus is going to reach out to the religious leaders through the quoting of this scripture as he fulfills prophecy. And as he does that, it too will be met by mockery. Listen to this in Matthew 27, 47. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Rest, the rest said, now leave him alone and let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Their statement of Jesus calling for Elijah was not to try and figure out what Jesus was saying. It was an extension of the cruel, cynical mockery that had been surrounding that entire scene that day. Why? Have you forsaken me? This is a phrase that as Jesus speaks it on the cross, it stops you cold. That Jesus would ever say such a thing to God. This statement on the cross has been the cause of study and much discussion in the church world. Why have you forsaken me? Scripture would indicate at least the following ideas. That as Jesus hung on the cross, he would feel God withdraw his presence from him. It's a statement that the deliverance of God and that God had brought to him before, like when he was 40 days tested in the wilderness and at the end of this horrible experience, ministering angels came to take care of Jesus. There were times that God sent ministering angels to help Jesus, but not this time. 
This time, Jesus would feel a separation, and this time, that kind of help would not come. Jesus could feel the separation from God, in fact, that only sin could cause. Jesus knew no sin. He was perfect. His relationship with God had never known a break. The sin of the world that was upon him, the very sin resulting in separation created a distance between him and God that he had not known. The reason for the answer, for the question that is asked in Psalm 22, 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is answered in verse 3 of Psalm 22. It starts this way, but you are holy. That holiness, that absence of sin, that complete intolerance of sin is why God turned his back. One of the great penalties of sin is separation from God. The cross becomes a symbol of loneliness. For the first time ever, somebody would be truly alone. The incarnation of Christ, Jesus becoming a man, already had created a partial separation from God. Jesus had been separated from the face-to-face privilege that he had with God in heaven and in his communication with God. On the cross, Jesus would find himself suspended between heaven and earth, rejected by both. Because of the horror of his appearance, men would turn away. Because of men's fear, they would run away. He was truly alone. Jesus took with him to the cross all the sin of mankind. Every mistake, every failure, every violation of every man and every woman and every child would be on Jesus. He who knew no sin would become sin. And because of that sin, there would be a distance and a separation between him and God. Why? Habakkuk 1.13 underscores the holiness of God. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Jesus called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There he hung alone. The cross, Jesus' loneliness, Jesus' separation provides something powerful for you and me, a guarantee. A guarantee that you will never be alone. Jesus was alone on that cross so that you never have to be alone. And in Hebrews 13, 5, it says this, I will never leave you or forsake you. Because of Jesus' loneliness, because of the separation from the Father, you never, ever, ever have to be alone. What an amazing gift was bought on that cross for you and me in the area of relationship. The second statement that Jesus made in the area of words of suffering, he said, I'm thirsty. John 19, 28 says this, later knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. This statement is the closest statement that will be made in all of this ordeal that would get close to reflecting anything that Jesus said about personal discomfort. He's been beaten. He's been nailed to wood. He's dying. And he says, I'm thirsty. But this statement is not a complaint. This statement is not whining. What it is is a fulfillment of Scripture. Psalm 69, 21 says this, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. This scripture shows the Messiahship of Jesus as he fulfills scripture. It also shows that Jesus' mind was so sharp 
that he was not going to drop the single, a single detail in his task. It also shows that when he was in the garden and he was wrestling with God about the events of this day, and he said, not my will, but your will be done, he not only decided to do it, he did it to perfection. He didn't just get through it. He didn't do it with a bad attitude. He didn't do it just because God said. He did it perfectly, fulfilling every prophecy in the process. Not only did he do it, not only did he do it the way God wanted, but he did it in full consciousness. I'm thirsty. What an incredible statement for one who claimed to be living water, who told a desperate woman at a well in the middle of the day, if you drink from the water that I give, you will never thirst again. And here he is saying, I am thirsty. In the final act of Jesus' life, we see a thirsty man. In response to his statement, a sponge is offered at the end of a stick. A drink is offered to Jesus, and the mockery continues. Now leave him alone, and let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. In this scene, this scene becomes a backdrop in which Jesus makes a statement, a final appeal to you and to me that you can trust him. In this statement, Jesus says to you and he says to me, you can trust me. It certainly isn't hard to imagine that Jesus was thirsty. The ordeal he had endured was physically almost unbelievably, unbelievable. No wonder his throat was dry and his lips were dry and cracking and his voice hoarse with thirst. To see the last time he had drunk anything, you'd have to wind the clock back 12 hours to the final meal he had with his disciples. Why would Jesus choose to go through such thirst? We know in Scripture he was offered a drink. Mark 15, 22. 23, I'm sorry. When they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Part of the answer we've already looked at, that Jesus would do this to fulfill prophecy. Jesus would fulfill over 300 prophecies in his lifetime. As an incredible as that is, that he's fulfilling prophecy while he's dying on a cross, I think there's a reason that's far more personal to you and to me that Jesus would say, I'm thirsty. Mark says it was, the drink was mixed with myrrh. Matthew describes it as wine mixed with gall. Myrrh and gall are both sedatives used to numb the senses. Jesus opted to pass on the drugs and the relief of pain and take the suffering head on. He did it because he knew you were going to feel pain too. He knew you would be weary and disturbed and angry. He knew that you and I would suffer. And if not in our bodies, then in our souls. Jesus endured the pain so that he could understand. It makes it easier for me to trust Jesus with my pain because I have watched how he handled his own. It makes it easier for me to take my pain to Jesus and to lay it at his feet when he was dealing, because when he was dealing with his, he didn't take an escape route. Even though the word trust does not appear in the story of Jesus' death, there's a statement in a wine-soaked sponge at the end of a stick, a statement that builds trust for me in trusting him when I hurt, all wrapped around a little sentence. I am thirsty. I'm thirsty is a statement that reminds us of Christ in his humanity. While he hung on the cross, 
he requested forgiveness for those killing him. How contrary to a human response. He had given words of comfort to others while he was dying. How uncharacteristic of a human response. I'm thirsty. That one's purely human. And it helps us remember how human he was. It helps us remember as we look at the courage of his example. As we look at the intensity of Christ's suffering. It adds such value, such significance, such hope, and such promise to Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. It's all seen at the cross. When man was at his worst, Jesus was still at his best. Life lessons Jesus gave in his dying words. Life lessons reflected in statements of forgiveness. Statements of comfort. And today, his statements of suffering. Life lessons in the words that Jesus spoke. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Last week, we talked about the fact that Calvary is a monument to the idea of choice, the acceptance or the rejection. And as I teach this lesson today, I'm amazed all over again. As I look at the suffering, as I look at the separation, as I look at the cost of sin, it amazes me all over again that God would then afford us the luxury of choosing to accept or reject what Christ did on a cross. But that's exactly how it works. And until opportunity is presented, it's difficult to identify choice. And for me to preach a message like this and get to the end of it and then not extend to you an opportunity, it would be immoral. It would be sin on my part. Christ died on a cross. He went through separation with God. And your sin was a part of that. And because your sin was a part of that, that means that the forgiveness and what Jesus did on that cross includes you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer of invitation. Maybe you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your life. I want to give you that opportunity so you can make a choice. Maybe you've been living for Jesus, but you haven't been doing it very well. And there's a lot of things that have crept in and you feel great distance between you and God. I would invite you to say this prayer with me too because that distance is not the way God wants things with you. He wants to be close. He wants to draw near to you and have you draw near to him. I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you quietly where you sit to repeat this prayer with me. And while we pray, God will hear every word. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for becoming sin for me. I admit to you that I have sinned. And I want you to know I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Give me hope and purpose 
and help me live this life the way you designed me to live it. In the name of Jesus, I pray.